welcome to what's going to be an amazing panel session, Living with Wildlife. We're so glad you're all here today to hear this incredible panel of speakers who I'm so honored to be with today. Please join me in welcoming our panel of speakers. Laylee Lichtenfeld, wildlife conservationist and Big Cats Initiative grantee. Poppy Borboroglu, marine ecologist and penguin conservationist. <laughs> Gladys Kalema Zikusoka, wildlife veterinarian and gorilla conservationist. <laughs> and Asha DeVos, marine ecologist and ocean educator. So I live and work in a place called Samburu in northern Kenya, and I started my project Iwasa Lions 10 years ago. When I started my project, I had one key question. Coexistence, is it actually possible for lions and people to live alongside one another? I very quickly realized that lion conservation is about people. And I started engaging with the community, the warriors, women, children, and it was only then that we started to make an impact on the lion population. We often call people the problem when it comes to conservation and conservation conflicts, whereas in fact, they can be the solution. And today you're gonna to hear from these amazing speakers about just that, how they have worked with communities for decades and have really instilled a culture of conservation and the communities they work with have made conservation a way of their life. So I'm gonna start with our amazing Laylee, Laylee Lichtenfeld, who co-founded African People and Wildlife back in 2005 in Tanzania. Laylee is a big cat conservationist expert, a real leader when it comes to community-based conservation. She strongly believes that people and wildlife can live in harmony, and you will hear some amazing stories from Laylee today. Laylee. Meet Alaraikuni. In the Maasai language, Alaraiku means leader, and he's leading the return of the lions in a stunning part of Tanzania. His roar booms outside the unfenced edge of Terengiri National Park, in listening distance of the Maasai people and their cattle. Our job is to keep him alive, which means preventing conflict, preventing him from becoming a cattle killer, and ensuring that he has room to roam. We do this by finding the balance between people and wildlife, those win-win solutions where all can thrive. Think about it. How do you feel about balance in your life? Does it bring you peace? I find my work-life balance in my five-year-old daughter, Kima, growing up in the wilds of Africa, a passionate and unfiltered existence. She told me, Mommy, stand up straight, be brave, and talk about the cheetahs. <laughs> I know you're watching, baby, my little coach. I hope you approve. The cheetahs are coming. <laughs> but I had a passion for Africa that ignited early in my life. Growing up in New Jersey, I was in love with wildness and large carnivores, obviously. My mother was like, what? What's a large carnivore? We live in Jersey. <laughs> but I followed my passion. And today, the big cats, the lions, the leopards, the cheetahs, and a great expanse of wilderness surrounds our home and headquarters in Tanzania. And there I work with my husband and an incredibly dedicated team over the last 20 years, 125 heroes strong. I wish they were all here today. Local Tanzanians, local people dedicated to the idea of balance, because no matter how large the protected area, humanity will touch it, they will impact it. In northern Tanzania, 92% of the landscape represents areas where people and wildlife share the land. And the African People and Wildlife team is working on preventing conflict and developing innovative community-driven strategies for people to engage in landscape level conservation. 50 Warriors for Wildlife act as ambassadors. They're protecting big cats, they're tracking them. They're helping herders to find lost livestock. And they do this because they treasure their cattle, but they do it also because as a community, they're incredibly tolerant with living with wildlife. They set a very important example for the rest of the world. We're installing our innovative living walls, which were co-designed with the Maasai people. 
These environmentally friendly predator-proof corrals provide a triple win for conservation. We're impacting 13,500 people on a daily basis. We are conserving over 150 lions, and we've planted more than 108,000 trees with this initiative. Win, win, and win. But if we want to be successful in conserving big cats in the long term, then we also have to think about imaginative ways to save space. This mother cheetah has been raising her cubs across Moss Island for the last, four, uh, for the last year. Four cubs successfully raising. Our land conservation strategies are helping her to survive. Imagine East Africa's famous savannas turning to desert. It's happening to the north of us. Our Sustainable Rangelands Initiative is working hand in hand with communities to develop innovative grassland protection projects. And we're also working to help communities to financially benefit from conservation, whether it's through wildlife-based tourism or focusing on the women, often so marginalized in these communities, to develop their own businesses, like beekeeping, that are respectful of nature. What this is all doing is giving Alar Iquini the chance to reign. Here he is courting a female. What more can we ask for than to ensure that the next generation of his cubs survives and thrives just as we want our own little cubs to do? I know we can do this, but we must do it together. And we must come together as a global community, because only by doing this will we come ever closer to a world in balance. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leili. Um, next, I'd like to introduce you to Poppy Borboroglu. Um, Poppy, who was there at last night's awards ceremony? It was, <laughs> it was an absolutely inspiring, incredible evening, and Poppy was the recipient of the Buffett Award for Leadership in Conservation. Poppy's from Argentina and founded the Global Penguin Society. He worked with government officials and set aside 3.1 million hectares of penguin habitat in Patagonia. It's astounding. He's also so passionate about working with children, the next generation of penguin conservationists. Please join me in welcoming Poppy. Thank you, Tiwani. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Hope you're doing fantastic this morning. So for thousands of years, humans, we have shared this planet with wildlife. When the population was small, there was enough space and resources for everybody. For example, 10,000 years ago, the population was only 5 million people. When my grandmother visited penguins uh, 100 years ago, the population was less than 2 billion people. And when my kids were small and I took them to the field to see the penguins, the population was 7.5 billion people. So we definitely need to learn to coexist with wildlife. As conservationists, our challenge is to change the behavior of people. We cannot change the behavior of a species. So we have to find out what are the drivers, what are the motivations of those people that are making them behaving, behave the, the way they do. So with that, with that information, we need to reach the people, and we need to cover as many fronts as we can. As Shivani mentioned, I lead the Global Penguin Society, which is an international organization that protects the 18 species of penguins in this planet, over half of which are listed as threatened. We generate science useful for conservation, we create and implement protected areas, and we also educate local and global communities. Penguins interact with people at different scales and at different environments. At large scale, they interact in the ocean when penguins swim hundreds and thousands of kilometers to feed and migrate, and they are impacted by fisheries, climate change, and pollution. And they also interact they also, sorry, they also interact at local scale because penguins, they spend a lot of months in one spot building their nests and taking care of their chicks. And they are affected by human disturbance and introduction of predators, mainly. Penguins are charismatic. It's official. <laughs> <laughs> they also offer magnificent wildlife spectacles that can generate thousands of jobs and a lot of uh, incomes for the local economies. 
and the economy is one of the main drivers of human behavior. And it has been very helpful for us to use that dimension to solve penguins and people's problems. And I'm going to tell you a story where you can see how we make people protectors and benefactors of penguin conservation. Ten years ago, we discovered a brand new colony of penguins. It had only six pairs of penguins. The place was a mess. Uh, they were used by reckless recreational fisheries and careless people. They used to throw garbage all over the place. And as you can see in this image, this uh, penguin with a plastic bottle around its neck. They used to set bushes on fire where penguins were nesting, and they also took pets, dogs that were harming the penguins. So we had to protect and to keep penguins safe, we had to close the gate to restrict access. It was not easy. They came with guns. They, tried, they put glue in our locker so we couldn't come in. But fortunately, we worked with the community and the government. We could designate this as a wildlife refuge, and we fostered a low-scale, responsible, ecotouristic operation. And now penguins and people are happy because that generated jobs for 20 people and a lot of incomes for the local economy. And the colony grew from six pairs 10 years ago to nearly 2,000 pairs now. So everybody wins here. Eighty percent of the wildlife in our planet occurs outside of protected areas. So we need to learn to behave well outside of protected areas. So each human beings, we need to be like a living, moving branch of protected areas when, where we, when we interact with wildlife. So our challenge now is to develop a conservation culture with a wiser and more sustainable relationship with wildlife. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Poppy. Gladys Kalema Zikusoka from Uganda. Gladys works with the endangered mountain gorillas in Uganda and Rwanda. Through her organization, Conservation Through Public Health, Gladys works with not just promoting health of the gorillas, but also health of the communities that live adjacent to their habitat. Please, welcome, please help me welcome Gladys to share her story. Hello, everyone. I'm very excited to be here from Uganda. Uh, mountain gorillas are one of the most critically endangered species on Earth. Um, we are as endangered as they are. We're happy that recently the numbers went up to 1,000. This particular gorilla is called Kanyonyi. He's one of my favorite gorillas. And I knew him since he was a baby. And he was born when gorilla tourism had begun like three years later. Um, unfortunately, Kanyonyi died in December due to normal causes, fighting and falling off a tree. But he represents how far tourism had gone because his father was the lead silverback of the first group to be habituated for tourism. However, I'm here to talk about how, I would like to talk to you about how community health is affecting the health of the gorillas and how by keeping ourselves healthy, we can ensure the survival of our critically endangered cousins. Gorillas are found in two distinct populations. Bwindi, where I'm working, um, where we have our main field station, and I've been working since I was a vet student in 1994, and then the Virungas, which is the other population, together with Rwanda and DRC. Gorillas are threatened by habitat loss, as they are in all the 11 countries where they're found in Africa. And in particularly around Bwindi and Virungas, there's a very high human population growth rate up to 300 to 600 people per square kilometer. So there's a very hard edge around most of the park. They're also threatened by, not so much by poaching for gorillas, but poaching for other animals in the forest. However, there's another threat, disease. One of the first cases I had to deal with as the first veterinarian for the Uganda Wildlife Authority was a scabies skin disease outbreak. The gorillas got scabies from people living around the park. The poor baby gorilla died and the rest only recovered with treatment. And that made us realize that we needed to start thinking about the health of the people around the park. Those three little boys, I found them grazing goats. They should have been in school. But as long as they don't go to school, they're poor and they're hungry and they're unhealthy, the gorillas will always be compromised. How did the gorillas get scabies? They went into people's gardens to eat banana plants and destroyed them. 
The farmer whose hand is over there, I asked him, are gorillas important? He said, yes, because my children are employed by the park and money from tourism is helping to build schools, clinics, roads. But the individual farmer like me, I'm not being compensated. He later became one of the leaders of the human and gorilla conflict resolution team that chases gorillas back to the park when they come out. Gorillas are also in contact with humans through sharing shared water sources. This is a microhydro dam built in the park to provide electricity. So we set up conservation through public health to secure the health of the gorillas and their habitat. We have three integrated programs, wildlife conservation, community health, and alternative livelihoods. And we train human and gorilla conflict resolution team members to chase gorillas back when they come out of the park and also monitor their health. We also carry out a lot of behavior change, sensitization, and communication. And we train village health and conservation teams to go out there and talk about the importance of the gorillas, the forests, as they improve people's health and hygiene, and refer people who are sick, and even offer family planning. We've trained some of them to give family planning injections, believe it or not. And the women are really taking it up, and it's really making a difference to their lives. We sustain them with group income generating projects, which also stop them from going into the park to poach. And we recently started a gorilla conservation coffee social enterprise where we give premium prices to farmers for good coffee, which we sell locally and nationally, and we want to start selling in the US as well. We find that gorillas are now protected in community land, and there's less disease in gorillas, and we're really pleased about that. We're so happy that the population has gone up from 700 to 1,000 since I started working with gorillas. And we want to expand the approach to other gorilla habitats and biodiversity hotspots. I mainly go by talking about Flora. She's one of the Batwa pygmies who were evicted from the park with her family when tourism began. But she works with us as a village health and conservation team. She sells, us, she sells crafts to people. Inside the, between Flora and me is my son, Indigo, who's been coming to the gorillas since been coming to Bwindi since he was little. He's wearing a mask that Flora made, and I'm holding her grandchild. And I believe that Flora and her community are gonna become conservation champions who will ensure that gorillas survive forever. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gladys. Our, our final speaker is Asha DeVos. Asha is from Sri Lanka, and she founded Sri Lanka's first marine conservation research and education organization called Oceans Well. She is a pioneer in blue whale research, and her life work is to change the current marine conservation world and work with a diverse group of ocean heroes, the next generation. Please help me welcoming Asha. I work with this unique, non-migratory population of blue whales off the coast of Sri Lanka. A beautiful tropical island with an unfortunate history of extraction from the ocean rather than protection of the ocean. But what I witnessed through my work is nothing less than extraordinary, heart-stopping. Heart-stopping because I am reminded that we have the privilege to live side by side with the largest animal that has ever roamed the planet. And heart-stopping because I witness how us human beings choose to interact with these species. Just a few months ago, I was out on the water and I had the privilege of spending some time with a pair of mother calf blue whales. I should point out that seeing blue whale mother calf pairs anywhere is actually quite rare. Over the course of a few hours, I got to see the calf spy hopping, rolling, breaching, and even potentially feeding. Behaviors we never see the adults perform. When I told people about this encounter, they were so excited and everyone wanted to know how we got so lucky. So I told them, I said we found the pair and then we switched off our engine and let them do their thing. The next day, I was back out on the water, and in the distance, I could see about 15 to 20 whale watching boats. Can we have the volume down, please? I could see 15 to 20 whale watching boats in the distance chasing down this mother calf pair of blue whales. Everything I could see told me that these animals were doing something completely different to what they were doing the day before. 
They were surging really fast, moving forward so quickly and diving and then holding their breaths for longer. Everything about this encounter told me that these animals were stressed. Everything about this encounter told me that these animals were trying to escape. And all of this, so these tourists can take a photograph and put it up on social media and get that coveted social media like. And then there are those incredible photographs that filter through our news feeds on a daily basis. The drone shots, the underwater shots, the side-by-side -side shots. But as we marvel at these photographs, how many of us actually stop to think about what went on during the process of this photo making? Sri Lanka has unfortunately become home to an unregulated and largely illegal swim with whale program. And everybody comes out, touts themselves as a famous photographer. But from what I can gather, their greatest victory is about getting a little too close, as close as possible, with little regard for the stress and harassment that they're causing for the subject, the species that they're trying to photograph, for that social media like that will enhance their profile and allow news media outlets around the world to pick up their photos and videos and propagate it further. These animals already live in a highly stressful world. They weave in and out of one of the busiest shipping highways in the world. And my crusade is to try to figure out how we, how our needs can coexist with these species and their incredible ecosystem. Because I want to ensure that our interactions don't all end up like this. Our interactions with them are akin to if, you know, you or I invited our family and friends over for a wonderful Sunday lunch, and a stranger came crashing through the front door, playing loud cacophonous music that hurt your ears and threw garbage everywhere. It's noisy, it stinks, it's in your food, and you are so afraid. So today, I want to ask all of you, a community of human beings who have the opportunity to interact with these species in these places and spaces. If you want to be respected in your homes, why can't we learn to respect these animals in theirs? Thank you. Thank you so much, Asha. That was amazing. Asha has brought up responsible tourism, and it's something we've been talking a lot about over the last couple of days. Um, I wanted to ask Gladys. Gladys, mountain gorillas, it's a huge tourist attraction in Rwanda, Uganda. What are your experiences of responsible tourism with gorillas, and what are the challenges you've faced? Actually, that's um, a great question. Responsible tourism with gorillas is a huge challenge because you're dealing with species that are very curious. Like the gorilla I showed you, Kanyoni, he's seen tourists all his life. He even used to like frightening tourists to see their reaction. <laughs> <laughs> so they, as much as we try and keep the five meter, actually extended from five to seven meters, as much as we try to keep the distance, the gorillas also break it. I know Leili came to visit us and you saw that when it happened. So it is a big challenge. And also tourists want to be close to them. You know, they've seen Sir David Attenborough and D Lion Dan Fossey, and they want to be, oh, I want to have a selfie with a gorilla, which is actually not very good. So, and <laughs> that they, we also really suffer from, of course, we can make them sick. You know, just a flu from anywhere around the world can wipe out a whole gorilla group. So one of the things that we're trying to push as conservation through public health, together with other partners, is for to people come visiting gorillas in Uganda and Rwanda to wear masks. It's already happening in DRC, where Emmanuel Demerod is, I think he's really enforced it. But in Uganda and Rwanda, the governments are like, mm, they're waiting to see what each one will say. But we really want people to start wearing masks just to reduce that. Mm. 
as well. Okay. <laughs> yeah. We're going to take a few more questions here, and then I'll open it up to the audience. Um, Poppy, you work across so many different countries. What are the challenges there? What can we learn from that? What are the lessons that you've learned from doing just that? Great question. Um, you know, most people think that there are three or four species of penguins, but there are 18. And, and everybody thinks that they are restricted to Antarctica. But the reality is that most of them, they live in temperate regions. Mm -hmm. Like they live in Namibia, South Africa, in six countries in South America. You know, you got from Galapagos near the tropics, you got tropical penguins. Peru, Chile, Argentina, Uruguay, Brazil, then New Zealand, Australia, and also Antarctica. So you're dealing with a, a different uh, combinations of cultures. So when we have like a campaign or we have an objective, we go to these places and we try to find out what are the values of the communities, or the values even of the countries, the values, the perspectives, and it has been very useful to use that, you know, to empower what we need to do. For example, in New Zealand, the penguins are considered Taonga species. It's a sacred species by the Maori community. And that's so powerful because you can do so many things with that. In other countries, they take them for granted. They just don't care. They, they've, they've, been, they've seen penguins all the time, but they don't value them. And, uh, and it's also very important to analyze the educational level of each community and each country. Just to tell you one story, we were working, uh, trying to pass a law in a Congress to declare a marine protected area. So we were working, convincing all the political parties. And one of the most influential persons was one guy that couldn't read or write. So all the science and all the you know, models that you have, you have to translate that into something that could be understandable and to give, translate the facts into something that you can convince. So you, you need to adapt, I think the great advice would be to be cross-cultural and understand and respect their values and perspectives. That's great. Thank you, Poppy. Leila, you work in Tanzania, but with different cultures. What is your experience with that? I think it's really interesting because uh, today in conservation, we're often asked uh, to go to scale as quickly as possible. And even in the communities that we work in across northern Tanzania, more than 30 now, we see nuances in every single one of those communities. The environment, the culture, the political situation, it's all different. And so a tool that we might use in one community is not one that would work in another. Um, that's why we believe it's very important to have science-based management behind our conservation strategies. We can find that one community may be having a lot of conflict at the BOMA and they need living walls desperately, but then another community may not have the conflict and if we are installing living walls in that community, it's a waste of resources, it's not addressing the problem from the local point of view. And so I think it's very important that we're nuanced in our strategies to conservation when we're working with communities, that we pull back and recognize that there are a large number of tools that we can have in our toolbox but it's the process and the approach of engaging with communities that is really transferable around the world. It's how you work with people. How much are they engaged in the process from the very beginning to the very end? Um, and that's the piece that I think that we can share globally uh, in our work. Oh, wow, thank you. We, you Community-based conservation, it's not something you do overnight. It's not something that you start today and you'll do for a couple of months or a couple of years and then you leave again. This requires long-term relationships. Asha, you've worked with communities for decades. Why do you think this long-term commitment is so necessary? I think it's incredibly important because um, you can't, you know, we always say success can't, doesn't come overnight, which is a fact. It's a combination of your whole life. And similarly, if you want to work in conservation, it's a slow process, there's a lot of persistence, because you have to gain the trust of the people you work around. I basically, when I wanted to become a marine biologist at the start, you know, Sri Lanka didn't have marine biologists. So everyone was like, what are you going to do with that degree? I was like, it's an <laughs> island. There's plenty of stuff to do. But apparently, I got it wrong, and they got it right. So, but the point being that, you know, I had to start by convincing people that this was a like a career path. Mm -hmm. Then I had to convince people that there was a good reason for let, letting me use their boat rather than sending it out to take whale watching operators. Then the government got all excited because they thought I was trying to shut down their harbors and their ports because I work with ship strike. That's my big thing. And they thought I was trying to shut down the ports, right? So it's been this, from the outside, some people are like, so have you shifted the shipping lanes to save the whales? That's their question every day. But my point is no, but I've seen the baby steps. I've seen the government and the people of Sri Lanka go from not knowing we had whales in our waters, like 
10 years ago to today being like, well, we need to do something to save them, right? And it's taken that long. It took me 15 years to get into a minister's office, even though I'm the only person in the country with the knowledge and expertise I have. But my advantage is like I, I hang around like a bad smell. I will never go away. <laughs> We have some time for questions from the audience, so please feel free to ask our amazing panel anything that's on your mind. Um, there's some mics all over the place. Please wait for the mic to come to you. There's a question there at the back. There's a mic on its way. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Elephant Man, but uh, my question today uh, for our marine conservationist. In Cambodia, uh, many islands are more attractive right now. And this uh, caused uh, increase of waste in the island. So we concerned about the uh, marine conservation and marine resource there. And we had uh, some approach. One of them, we want to uh, recycle. Uh, the waste on the island to produce the power, uh, electricity from the from the waste. So this, I think, the one of the good uh, option. But uh, from your experience, you have another uh, good experience for waste management on the island. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so that's a great question. I'm not a waste management expert, so I don't think it would be fair for, for me to make too many answers. Also, it's very specific to a particular area. And just like Lily said, I think um, I would have to know more about the area and the place uh, before I could even make real comment on that. That would be any, of any use, but we can definitely try to talk about this afterwards. Okay. Great, thank you. It's a question down here in the front. Hey, thanks for bringing that up. I 100% agree with you about tourism, ecotourism, photographers. But what I'd like to hear from you, because I think it's a really important statement that you've just made, is what are, what are your thoughts about what to do about this issue? I mean, a lot of us have um, tried to develop tourism as, a, as an alternative to fishing or all, all of these other you know, things that are happening in the developing countries. But what would be your you know, what would be your recommendation of how to deal with this tourism more sustainably? So I think that um, for one thing is it's about empowering the people who are running the industry. And I think oftentimes, certainly in Sri Lanka with the whale watching tourism, it came up overnight. And suddenly, honestly, I've seen fishing boats being basically um, taken off the beach. And then the next day they go out as whale watching boats, right? So this is just constantly happening because suddenly it seems more lucrative and stuff like that. But there's a huge education component that's been missing. And so for me, it's about really going to the communities and we're going to do actually a big piece of research uh, funded by Nat Geo on the sustainability of the whale watching industry, which will include having these conversations with these uh, whale watch operators. Oftentimes they feel that if they can fulfill the guest's request to get as close as possible, then they'll get a bigger tip, which has never been proven, right? So that's a big problem, and having those conversations. So we want to target not just the whale watch operators, but we also want to target the people who are selling tours. Now, in Sri Lanka, until recently, we had people riding elephants. But now a lot of the tour companies are saying, we're not selling tours that allow you to ride an elephant, right? So we had, we're going to try to work at all these different levels. Plus, empowering people in Sri Lanka to realize it's their natural resource, and we can say no to an outsider. Because an outsider is more likely to care less about what's happening in another country than in their own country. And it's about time we stood up for our own rights and our own resources and what our natural heritage and spoke out. And that's what I want our people to do. Yeah. And we're seeing similar things in Tanzania, where uh, people love to surround the cheetahs. And you know, finding a cheetah is like finding a needle in a haystack. They're, um, a species that needs you know a lot of space uh, they're competing with hyenas and leopards and lions so when they hunt you know they really need to be able to hunt they need to get their food they need to eat it quickly and when you have safari vehicles racing after them or surrounding them you're not allowing them to uh, do what they need to do 
And what I've seen that's very encouraging is a lot of the Tanzanian uh, tour operators, you know, are really frowning upon this and, you know, kind of saying, hey, you know, guys, you can't do this. Um, so I think it's working in country with those operators, institutions, but also don't like that shot mm -hmm. of the cheetah on top of the car. Mm -hmm. It's not a good idea, <laughs> you know. So, you know, many penguin colonies are very important touristic destinations and uh, you have pros and cons. Like one colony in Australia, they represent $150 million per year. So that they are important, but there has to be a balance. So, of course, it's not about just creating a, a protected area. We work a lot to design management plans and also to empower the, the government to enforce the laws. And, uh, for example, in, in Australia, in Argentina, we have also whale watching. And there are strong laws, but we're all the time, you know, trying to help the authorities to enforce the laws because it's a, like any other activity. It could be fine, but to some extent, you know. But on the other side, it has been one of the most powerful tools for us to go to the negotiation table in the Congresses and say, and you know, talk to fisher, the fish, the large scale fisheries, the oil industries. We are we are talking to those guys. So we say, hey. This eco-touristic industry represents this amount of money. It's not, it's not just about oil and fish. It's also about ecotourism. But we cannot be part of, of an activity that is affecting our wildlife. Thank you, Poppy. Um, yes, there's a question here in the front. My question is um, addressed to the gentleman that works with the penguins. I was wondering if you could tell us, uh, since you have such an extended area that you protect you know, for the penguins, is there any other species or uh, singular or plural that can coexist with the penguins so that while you're conserving the area, you can also assist other species in addition to the penguins? Thank you so much for the question. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So yeah, we work especially, I mean, my work is focused on penguins, but we use penguins as the umbrella to protect many other species. And they are these lands, seascape, landscape species. Penguins, they, one Magellanic penguin, like this one, the ones that live, they swim 16, 10,000 miles, kilometers per year, like a car, you know? They swim all, so imagine all the, the vast areas in the oceans that they use. And they share that space with many other species. But when we use the face of a penguin, that can be very beneficial because that can open a lot of doors. People pay attention. We get the communities on our side. Com politicians say, oh, people are paying attention. We have to do something. So we work specifically for the penguins. And in this case, like the, 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 that protected area of over 3 million, we are also protecting over 700 species of marine wildlife. And then we started with the ocean, and then we were, when we were working with the communities, we ended up working on land, you know? So like 40% of that protected area is now land. So penguins are protecting the land as well, because when you open the door, thanks to the penguins or many other charismatic species, you can protect many other species that we don't know enough about, or maybe they are not so attractive as penguins. <laughs> Well, thank you, thank you, Poppy. Um, I have a question for my for my panelists. Um, Gladys, what is the next big thing for you, um, yourself personally, or through conservation, through public health? What is? Do you have a big project coming up? What is n next for Gladys and your organisation? Um, the next big thing um, is we'd like to scale up our approach. We're trying to look at what we can scale up within what we have. Um, as Lely said, you can't necessarily scale up everything but trying to see what we can scale up to other places. And actually, National Geographic has given us a grant to go to another parish which has a lot of human and gorilla conflict, but has had very little tourism and very little support from other NGOs. So we, st we started that particular scale up, and we're really excited to see how that goes. But we'd also like to go to other protected areas where gorillas are found, and also in other countries. We have a small project in Virungas, uh, working with the health centers around the park, but we'd like to go to other protected areas as well. That's great. Thank you, Gladys. We have less than a minute, so I want to quickly ask the same question. Asha. So for me, um, 
I'm, I basically have done all of this stuff for the last 10 years on my own. And last year, I started my own nonprofit. I have one staff member, so I'm like winning <laughs> right now. Um, so it's really about, the point is that, uh, like I said, when I started, I was the only real marine conservationist. It started a movement. More students than ever before want to become marine biologists. Um, I have a lot of hope. But I also realize there's a huge gap in terms of access to knowledge and education. So I'm really trying to build on uh, creating courses and a opportunities for students to learn, but also to come out in the field and work on projects. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to grow that army, and I want to make Sri Lanka you know, this, um, this example of um, what can actually be possible from a tiny island nation in the middle of the Indian Ocean. That's amazing. Thank you. Lady? Uh, we have made an organizational commitment to quadruple our engagement over the next 10 years. We're working also on ways to share that process and approach to community-driven conservation, taking best practices from around the world. But most importantly, I think, and relevant to this morning's conversation is, I am very, very aware that I'm one of the only female CEOs in conservation in the landscape where I work. And uh, that can be a lonely place to be. Mm -hmm. So we are making a commitment to begin a women in conservation internship program with our organization to get more Tanzanian women involved in conservation and with our team. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Coffee. Very briefly. Yeah. So we are uh, working to designate new marine protected areas in countries like Argentina, national marine parks. Uh, we are expanding our educational work to many other countries. And uh, one challenge that we have now is we are going to assess the nature and magnitude of the illegal traffic of penguins. Right. We, with the expansion of the Asian communities, we are receiving a lot of denounces. They are stealing penguins from all over, endangered species. They use it for uh, new aquariums, for private collections, many, many issues. And we fostered the establishment of the IUCN Penguin Specialist Group, so we are using that high-level structure to help us go and, and, and face this new threat. Wow, thank you. These guys are amazing. I've had the pleasure of spending time with them this week, and it's just been such an amazing week. Please feel free to come and speak to the speakers later during the breaks and get to hear more from them. Thank you all for being such a great audience, and thank you to our panelists.